Well, hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Nefesh podcast. My name is Sandy Jo Leonard, and I'm happy to have you listening. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. If you've been listening, thanks for listening, and would love to get some feedback on what you're liking or enjoying about the episodes. Even if you just tell me I put you to sleep, I'm okay with that. Um, and you can email me at the, the Nefesh podcast at gmail.com. Uh, again, we'd just love to connect and hear some of your own stories as we dive deeper into really what what our soul is and the whole aspect of soul and spiritual formation as it relates to all parts of our lives. And, and you know, this week, this past Monday was Mental Health Day. Uh, and I want to get into that a little bit more in some future episodes as it relates to our soul, that we are such interconnected beings that we cannot separate all these other parts of us and the things that happen to us and the challenges that we face. But I, to, to, for this episode, I want to talk about this idea of chaos, chaos and the soul. And no, I'm not going to get into the, the law of physics or um, the realm of physics, I should say. There's not just one law of physics. There's, there's a lot of laws and they're all beyond me. That's not, that's not an area I understand very well at all uh, because there's a whole, I think, chaos theory and all that kind of stuff. And it's only stuff I probably have heard from the Big Bang Theory show um, or other, other episodes, other TV uh, shows. So we're not going to get into any of that. But, you know, I was, I was, um, this, this idea, and especially this word came to my mind, um, reflecting upon the parts of our life that we really do try to control and manage and, and how much life I think at times feels out of control and feels, um, feels like chaos, feels like we are in a state of chaos. And, you know, if you've got kids, you understand this very well. I don't have any kids of my own, but uh, I have uh, been involved in the lives of many of my nieces and nephews for a long time, watching kids all my life. Um, but I, I especially understand this whenever I have to watch my nieces and nephews, especially when they were younger and their parents would be out of town. It's kind of like your whole world gets turned upside down and you've got to care for these little ones and make sure that they get to bed and eat and, you know, you got to feed and water them and, and, and make sure to change their diapers and bathe them and get them off to school if they need to go to school. And really you, uh, we as individuals, as adults, uh, we come last, right? It's all about making sure they get where they need to go. And, um, and, and if they have bad dreams, they may end up in your bed as one of my nieces like to do a lot. Uh, when she, in fact, she used to sleepwalk. And so she would just sleep right on, sleepwalk right on into bed. And, and, uh, uh, it's hard to sleep when there are kids in the bed. Right. And so, um, it, but it's all about their comfort and, and, and taking care of them. And really the focus is on them, but everything, everything becomes chaotic. I've, I've had kids, uh, go number two on my carpet. I've had them throw up in my car. Um, I've had, you know, all sorts and you too, right? If you're a parent, you understand that the chaos of, of children. I remember one weekend, I was watching my, my uh, little nephew, he was just about a year old, his parents went on, went out for a, a, like a weekend retreat, and I had to be at church on that Sunday morning, I was on staff at a church, and had to go, had to be there early, had to teach uh, Sunday school, and I had to be there on time, because, you know, you can't, it, junior hires are, are like infants, you can't leave either of them alone for any period of time, and so, got to get there, got to teach, you know, junior high Sunday school, and and here's this little guy and he, you know, the easiest kid, really, you know, cute and kind of independent, but, um, but he took forever to eat and I'm sitting there, you know, he's one, he can't quite feed himself yet. And yet he loves to eat and he still loves to eat, but he loved to eat back then. And like, he couldn't, it's, it's as if, can you not chew any faster? I can't shovel this food into your mouth any quicker than you'll, you know, chew and swallow. And so I just remember that morning feeling so chaotic 
And especially because it was out of rhythm for what I, my life normally was, right? Being, um, being on my own, I, and could drive and go and places where I needed to get, and I could be there on time and I could have things nice and neat and, and orderly and organized. But it just felt like that morning, no other part of the weekend was chaotic, but that morning felt chaotic because I was trying to get somewhere, trying to take care of this kid. And it was like rushing around just to get to the place that I needed to get him to church, drop him off in the nursery and get where I needed to go. And it was like, oh my gosh, I have been with this kid, I don't know how long and, you know, all of his life and taken care of him many times. But it was, it was this chaos, this, this addition to my otherwise orderly uh, life or, or the, the sense of order that I have. And, you know, we all have that there. There are some people who, who look like they live in a type of organized chaos and you know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, we know who you are, um, that where they, they, there's a sense of order within their chaos. Um, and even there, those who seem incredibly disorganized and incredibly all over the place, there's a sense of order that they have within their disorder. There's a sense of, of organization or control within their within their chaos themselves all of us as humans have to have a a sense of rhythm a a sense of equilibrium homeostasis a, a sense of stability and even if the we you know the the next meal we're not always sure where the next meal is coming from or the next place to sleep there's some type of uh, sense of stability that we look for, even in that instability, that there's something we can count on. There's something that we try to bank on for sure. There's, there's something that we look to, to try to find a, a sense of order and order is good. Organization is good. Now, um, some of you are super organized. I do not profess to be super organized. People have have commented that I'm, you know, that I'm really organized. I think, man, you just, you cannot see inside of me because inside of me, I feel very disorganized. If you come into my office, you're going to see papers on, on the desk that probably haven't been moved in a couple of months uh, because I'm not quite sure what to do with those papers. So they just kind of sit there. And if you get into my car, you may see it. It's not terribly dirty. It's not like I've got piles and piles of clothes in my car, but you may see a cup or two on the ground that I haven't quite gotten back into the house and might see a few papers lying around. And if you come into my home, you're going to see, uh, again, it's not filthy or completely out of order, but you're going to see it's, it's, there's, it looks like it's been lived in, right? So there may be a couple of dishes in the sink, or there may be, um, there may be some laundry that hasn't been put away. If you, if you know me or know anything about me, you know that I, I can wash the clothes, I can dry the clothes, but the, the most boring part of laundry, I feel like is folding clothes. I don't, I don't know why it just is. So you might see that. So there's, but even there, so I'm not the most organized, I'm not the most um, uh, neat in, in all of that, I'm certainly not the most chaotic, but I'm surprised always when people say, wow, you're just, you know, you just seems like you're so organized. Um, and it probably appears that, again, on the outside, but on the inside, of course, and that's true of all of us, there is a sort of internal movement and at times i i know for for many there are times of a a sense of internal chaos and some of us are not aware of it some of us um, are more attuned to it than others and and may attempt to try to get a semblance of control in fact for some of us, our attempt to organize our surroundings in a very neat and, and precise way is a way for us to try to manage the internal chaos. But all of us, all of us struggle with some type of internal and external chaos. Forces coming at us from the outside. Again, if you've got kids or pets or or any uh, uh, type of, uh, you live anywhere near people, their lives are going to bump into your own and you're going to experience uh, some external chaos. And we all will 
and maybe do on a constant basis struggle with an internal type of chaos, with, with an internal monologue that it may be hypercritical or uh, depressing or worrisome or feelings that don't feel like they ever fully settle and we're going from one uh, extreme emotion to the next or from one high to another low or maybe physically we're, we deal with chronic pain and so the internal pain is literal internal pain inside of us and it is a constant steady almost drumbeat of pain that keeps that keeps us from stillness and from finding peace we all struggle with external and internal chaos it's all around us and yet every person in life is constantly trying to find a state of peace and happiness and stability and homeostasis it's why we turn to addictions it's why we turn to uh, are quick to give in to whatever desire it might be rather than be disciplined in in all areas of our life there's a whole there's a whole willpower uh, thing that I like to talk about when I talk about spiritual formation that we run out of it we litter well not literally but figuratively and some of us do literally run out of energy but but there's only a certain amount of willpower that keeps us going that what has to come to the surface to keep us going beyond that willpower is more than just discipline it's the character and the values that that upon which we've built our lives and in spiritual Christian spiritual formation it is the character and value and foundation of what we are allowing Christ to do transforming inside of us and it is upon that that we manage to get out of bed every day and do the things that we feel like God wants us to do but chaos external and internal chaos constantly challenge us and while we are desperate for peace and we are desperate for a sense of stability and desperate for a sense of of control and where we might might find moments and pockets of it more often than not we are day-to-day -day struggling to find and battle those forces and those 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 things crowding in on us those chaotic moments and feelings and thoughts several years ago Mike Iaconelli who is one of the who was he passed away uh, but was one of the forerunners of youth ministry he is he is for those of you who've ever been in youth ministry and he, he's right up there with with the Doug Fields and the Jeannie Mayos um, of of youth ministry I mean he is just well known and, and um, again one of the forerunners of really developing quality and good youth ministry and um, I love how he wrote a book titled Messy Spirituality and this was written later on and I believe this was written when he after he had become a senior pastor um, and again he has since passed away but he wrote a book titled Messy Spirituality and that is a phrase that that I have equated with spiritual and soul formation uh, since I heard it I thought yes that is a great way to talk about the type of struggle and chaos and growth and regrowth that takes place in the life of all of us it's messy again if you don't understand this you just wait till you have kids um, I mean even pets will will show you how messy life is life is messy but so is our spirituality life is chaotic and so is our spirituality that we that is a part of the growth process the internal and external forces of chaos I believe 
are not necessarily bad things. Now, chaotic people who are more, well, let me rephrase that. There are some people who are more chaotic than others. And again, you may not know who you are, but we know who you are. Um, and we might be chaotic to other people, but there, you know, there are some people, some of us just, just have a knack for, for causing chaos and, and causing disorder. And so some of us, we just explode with it. We walk into a room, into a house or into a setting, and we are just chaotic from the get go. And, and everything becomes about us and, and getting us organized and getting us, you know, situated in, in a sense of stability and, and we rely upon the stability and, and kind of security of others to help us. That's a, that's a different type of chaos. And again, some of us are more prone to that than others. And there's some type of chaos that we unfortunately invite into our lives through bad choices. That type of chaos at times feels... Well, I don't know if it's harder or if it's, if it's, if it's just the same to deal with, but then there's some chaos that comes uninvited, that comes, that, that comes at the expense of others where, or others and their actions or life. And it's just reality, such as natural disasters bring upon us chaos that we didn't invite. We didn't ask for, we didn't, we didn't want. And we are stuck dealing with chaos that perhaps we didn't deserve and we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't invite. Is it possible to make anything with that chaos and that mess? Now, even though I'm not the tidiest and the neatest person in the world, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, like Pigpen or anything from the, the Charlie Brown cartoon. But, um, but even though I'm not the most tidy and the most organized, uh, in my mind, my, I learned from an early age to, to attempt to s develop some type of homeostasis and organization. I, I have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. One of my many, one of my many uh, things that I have have struggled with, but um, and I remember picking this up uh, at a in my teens. I probably um, was managing it prior to that, but it it kind of came to my for the forefront of my memory when I was about thirteen or fourteen, and that's right at the age of you know teenage rebellion and all of that kind of stuff. But it wasn't so much rebellion with me as it was a desire to just try to manage the chaos. I come from a big family, and uh, while it was lots of fun, um, there was also lots of chaos. And so for me, I learned to attempt to manage the chaos through um, attempting to control what I could. And so it would start with locks and making sure the doors and the windows of, of my house were locked. And uh, to everybody's uh, chagrin, you know, my family, although many of them, most of them were much more patient than others as I would walk, you know, knock on their door to go into their bedroom and check to make sure that their window was locked. Most of the time they were patient. And, you know, a few times they were, they were about ready to throw me out the window, but you know, it, it, it somehow we survived, but um, it, it, it were, it started with those types of things. And, and even to this day, I've, I've kind of got that routine. It turned into, you know, merged into other things, making sure the alarm clock was set, making sure uh, my tires aren't flat before I get into a car and drive. And um, what I've learned over through many, 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 many years of, of help and, and, and understanding all of that is to, is to manage it. And it, it's still a presence in my life, but it doesn't dominate like it, like it has at other times. What I've learned as a result of all of those things is that that was something I picked up as a way, as a mechanism, a way of attempting to control things that felt out of control. If I can just verify, I can just check that that door is locked, somehow that get, gave me a, an inner sense of stability an inner sense of control. 
attempting to control the things that I, that I really could not. Part of, I feel like in life, and I know that this is true for our spiritual formation, part of that spiritual formation process is really, is really coming to a point of letting go and surrendering to the process that Jesus is doing in our lives. And that's a hard thing for us to do. We know Jesus tells us to die to ourselves, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. But we all struggle with what that means. Part of what that means is he really did mean for us to surrender. But what does that look like on a daily basis? Part of that surrender process is learning to let go of the things that we want to control or make happen or manipulate. The other part of that, I think, is allowing for chaos to be present. Allowing for loose ends to not all be tied up. Allowing for some problems to be unsolvable, or at least at the moment unsolvable. Allowing some needs to not be met the way we would want them to. Allowing some prayers to not be answered the way we want them to. Allowing the people in our lives that we care for to make their own decisions despite what we think, and despite how bad those decisions might be. Control really is an illusion. There is only so much over which we have control. And though we believe that as followers of Jesus, that there is a spiritual reality and a spiritual empowering to live and to, yes, to do miracles to a certain extent in the world. There's also a limiting fact to that. There is a limiting reality to that. The understanding that while Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead once, Lazarus did then die again. Because these are the constraints of the world in which we, we currently live, but will not live forever. It is interesting to me that in the beginning, in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, and especially in the Hebrew it describes the state of the earth, the state of creation, as tohu and bohu. I had a professor uh, in, in, in school, um, uh, Dr. Scott Daniels, who, who, uh, who described this as kind of like two, two big, um, you know, those sumo wrestle, wrestling suits that you put on that you, you know, you're in these padded suits and you, you can barely walk and you're just kind of bumping up against each other. You can't really do anything in those sumo wrestler suits um, because you're just, you're just waddling around. I mean, you're encased in plastic, blown up uh, plastic suits and you're just trying to like basically lay on top of the other person to get them down. So you're, you just looks like you're bumping into each other. And he described this experience. He described this Tohu and bohu, almost as that, this, this type of chaos of just bumping into one another. Some translations in, in Genesis 1-2, um, Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, or the earth was, was void and without form, as some translations say. That formless and void, or that... that um, uh, depending upon what the tra English translations say, those words are tohu 
and bohu. And these words are, um, have been often difficult to, to translate because tohu is used elsewhere in the Bible, but, but bohu never appears on its own. And it seems maybe possibly an alliteration or something that's kind of poetic, tohu, bohu. But in other passages where tohu and bohu are used, it's used to describe chaos. And so in the context of where these words are elsewhere, in the context of what uh, uh, biblical scholars seem to think, what is going on here is a type of a, a space in which there is there is. Obviously, it is without, without God's presence or touch, without his creation. But in, in its essence, it's chaos. The earth was in chaos, a moving, and, and maybe you're picturing like molecules, I'm kind of picturing molecules bumping back and forth and, and a sense of movement, but no clear direction, no clear sense of, of, of what is going to happen, and just a lot of things kind of pressing up against each other. And it was dark. It was chaos. Darkness was over the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God, it says, was moving or was hovering over the face of the waters. It's interesting that at the very beginning of creation, there was chaos. And in fact, some religions, the, the Babylonian uh, Enuma Elish, which is the creation narrative for the Babylonian, ancient Babylonian religion, it describes a creation narrative that is, has been described by, by James Livingston as, as uh, the creation out of conflict and chaos. That out of this chaos and conflict, the gods, plural, in the Babylonian religion, create. But it's a much different creation because even the chaos and the conflict that's described in the Babylonian Enuma Elish is... The gods are at war with one another, and uh, it's out of that conflict that finally they're there, and the chaos that comes that comes between the conflict that humanity is created, but humanity is only created to be servants of the gods, and, and I think in one passage is described as being food for the gods, and the gods are coming up out of the waters themselves because... Uh, you've got the higher gods who are creating the lower gods who are coming up out of the crew, out of the waters, and and they're fighting for one another for control. And then comes out of this comes the creation. And it's been noted by scholars the difference between the Babylonian Enuma Elish and the Genesis one passage, that the Babylonian Enuma Elish is conflict, is chaos. There's no clear sense of order. Things are continually, so we've got that image of things bumping into each other and just, just fighting for one another. And finally, 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 humans coming out of that, but it's still conflict and chaos. But in Genesis 1, you have chaos. But then God speaks. But then God creates. And what you see in Genesis 1 is an orderly procession of God creating out of the chaos. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the seas, the, the sky, and then finally humanity. The crowning, the crowning achievement of his creation and its order And this God existed even before creation. And he is in control. In the Enuma Elish, there's no one in control. It's, it's the inmates who are running the asylum, as we say. Um, there, there's, there's nobody in control. It's all chaos. But in Genesis 1, there is a God who is 
above the chaos. There is a God who was before everything. And there is a God who takes the chaos and creates something out of it. He creates the earth. He creates you and I. God created out of the chaos. He created humanity out of dirt. Jesus in the Gospels spits into the ground, creates mud from his spit and the dirt and puts this mud on a, a man's tongue who is mute. That's gross. I mean, it just, it's gross. It reminds me of the time, I mean, if, if you're ever a mom, you, you, or if you're a kid whose mom did this, you know, they lick their thumb or they lick their Kleenex and they try to wipe something off your face. Gross. Jesus did that, spit into the ground, created in mud, put it on this stuff, this, this mute man's tongue, and, and this man was healed. Out of chaos, out of dirt, God creates. It's an incredible thought, and I wonder... I wonder if the chaos in our lives, which will never fully go away, you, you, can, you can try to manage it as much as possible. In fact, you can go away from every other person and you will still have chaos. It will be your own internal chaos. You can try to manage it and managing it is good and limiting it is good. All of those things are good with just a reminder that that the chaos, not all chaos, is bad. And not all chaos, God may be moving, and more than likely is moving, in the chaos that we are experiencing. Not only do we believe, as, as Romans 8 tells us that God works all things for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Not only do we believe that, we believe that the chaos that takes place, that God is doing something within us to create and to grow. There is what is known as cognitive dissonance. It, it is a part of a learning process. Cognitive dissonance is whenever we learn something new and whenever we learn something new that challenges our understanding or our awareness of something, it causes an internal dissonance. Uh, I've used the example before of, of you know, people, kids who believe that Santa Claus exists and then they find out that he doesn't. They're really invested in Santa. These are the diehard Santa Claus fans <laughs> and they find out he doesn't exist and they're devastated because it, it's, it, this new information is so overwhelming to them. It's causing an internal chaos that erupts into tears or anger or whatever. And, you, you know, if, if hopefully, if, unless there's some other mental health issues, the child will get over it. But the, the, the chaos that is temporary is the learning the new information and having to take that new information and adjust it into an old paradigm. Learning, discovering that my parent is rather Santa Claus and not the real Santa Claus is a new, is a new paradigm that I have to adjust. I have to adjust this new information into this old paradigm. And so it's causing a mental, a cognitive dissonance, meaning I think dissonance in terms of like a, a chord that is maybe out of tune or something or sharp and you hear it and it's, it just causes dissonance, chaos, internal uh, discombob discombobulation and um, things just are not almost as if you're, you're not quite steady or you're, 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 um, head is reeling. You may have experienced that. You learn something, you experience something, and you all of a sudden it's as if you can't stand anymore and your head is reeling from the new information. Cognitive dissonance happens 
in those experiences, and it's not always negative. So we experience cognitive dissonance when we, when something that we learn really touches us, we're able to hear it. Something isn't blocking it. Something is communicated well enough that we get it. We understand it and it, it clicks for us. Have you ever had that where you've read a book once and then maybe you read it again and it's like, wait, wow, this is a really good book. Why didn't I catch this before? Maybe we weren't at a point where we could hear or understand or learn what it was trying to say, but the message, um, the message that is coming across now is hitting us and touching us. And in those moments that cognitive dissonance is causing our paradigm, our understanding of what we thought we knew to grow and to change. Well, cognitive dissonance, whether it's a, a negative thing that we learn or a positive thing, is a type of chaos. Our mind, our brain has to reshuffle, has to reset in order to put this new information in there and allow our minds to absorb it and then apply it. Chaos happens every time we learn, really learn something new. We can't avoid chaos. We can avoid some of it. We can't avoid all of it. And some chaos, some chaos comes as a result of positive things. God uses all chaos. And in all of the chaos, God is at work trying to reorient our thinking, reorient our perspectives, reorient our understanding of him and of others. Chaos can drive us closer to him and can be the motivation for growth and can be the very place where God wants to be present in a way that he, you have never experienced before. Just like as at creation, God is there in the midst of all of our chaos, whether self-inflicted or a reality of life. And I believe that God, just as, as all of life is messy, our spirituality is messy, and God is in the midst of that mess all of it, all of the chaos, and is at work helping us to grow, helping us to see, helping us to understand, helping us to learn, helping us to change so that we can grow closer to him. You probably have heard it said that those times of growth really don't happen in the, the great, what we would call mountaintop experiences. That the true times of growth take place, the deep, deep, deep root, root work that needs to take place within us often takes place in those valleys. And maybe those valleys are more like chaos, that tohu and bohu, that is bouncing around all over us and bouncing around inside of us. And I think I would invite you and even myself, speaking very much to myself here right now as well, what is the chaos that is taking place in your life? Where is the external and internal chaos? Are there some things that you can in fact manage? You don't need to bring any more chaos on your life. The life will bring its own. So if there's some chaos you can manage, manage it. But what is the other chaos that, that is a lot harder to get at? Or that is out of your control? What is the, the tohu and bohu that is taking place around you and inside of you? What is that? And what might God be doing in the midst of that? What might he be saying to you in the midst of that chaos? 
How does God want to be present in our lives in the midst of that chaos? And I just want to pray, Father, as we struggle with so much chaos. And Father, we invite you into that chaos. That you would speak life and light. That you would create and bring new life. Bring new hope, new vision. Out of that chaos, out of that darkness, out of that void. Would you bring shalom, peace? Be present in the midst of all of our chaos. We invite you in and invite you to take control as we surrender it to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for listening to this episode, episode 13. And I'm um, glad to, again, have you with us. Would love to hear, would love to hear how this is either ministering to you or, or your feedback, your thoughts, things that you're enjoying um, and or not enjoying. And you can, you can email me, the Nefesh podcast at gmail.com. Would love to, would love to uh, even just pray with you and, and connect with you. And I'm looking forward to our next podcast as we'll be talking with some good good friends and their really, really uh, traumatic experience um, and the, the challenge that it was for their soul um, living through a real life natural disaster. And so um, I want you to hope you join us episode 14 next time and we'll see you next time.